We're going to keep kind of with the theme of Easter, <clears throat> even though it's post-Easter now, and uh, start out with our sermon reading, which is a, a scripture that I know you've heard me read to you before. 2 Corinthians 5.21 simply says this, God made him, being Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's a powerful scripture that we're going to look at today. So here we are, it's post-Easter, 2,000, maybe 18 years ago, no, not quite that much, but uh, Jesus was born 2,018 years ago or somewhere in that time frame. But around 2,000 years ago now, uh, Jesus has gone through the passion, the cross, the resurrection, Jesus is back in heaven. That's awesome. The question is, how do we get there with him? How does God judge a person's life in this world? Now, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but I've heard this story about Billy Graham. Early in his, his career, he was out uh, preaching revival in a small town, and, and this was back in the days when he actually sent mail you know, through the post office. So he had letters that had to be sent, and, and he went down the street, and he asked a young boy, he said, uh, do you know where the post office is? Can you show me where the post office is? And the young boy said, sure, mister, go down about a block, turn right, and it's right there. And he said, well, hey... I'm doing a revival service here in town tonight. How would you like to come to revival service and I'll tell you how to get to heaven? And the little boy looks at him and says, no thanks, mister. He says, well, why not? He says, shoot, you don't even know how to get to the post office. How are you going to tell me to get to heaven? It doesn't make sense, right? I don't know. It might be made up. It could be. Who knows? But there's lots of people sharing about how you get to heaven and lots of opinions about how to get to heaven. And we truly live in a pluralistic society now. Uh, It's a big focus on diversity. There's a big focus on on, uh, understanding and on acceptance of other people. And I think that is a wonderful thing. I love the idea of diversity and acceptance of people. Um, uh, Kathy and I were excited when we were told we were moving here to Elkhart because we saw that this was a more diverse place than where we had been living. And we wanted to be in a place of diversity and, and to be able to share all that takes place in the midst of that. And even through technology, we are now more, I would guess you would say, interconnected with diversity of cultures and belief systems and, and, and religions than ever before. And today I'm going to take really a comparative look at religions and, and a view of, their, really their view of God, their view of what you would call soteriology, which really means their, their, their idea of salvation or, or the afterlife or heaven. And, and really these things are telling about who God is more than anything else. Now, as a minister, I don't know how many times people have come up to me and asked me, how do you get to heaven? And they talk to me, and, and when they talk to me, it's, they want to get an assurance of heaven for themselves. And, and honestly, they have real fear. They have real doubt within their lives. They, they need real assurance. And, and so often what I hear are things like, well, I sure hope I make it, preacher. I sure hope I make it. You know, I'm trying really hard to get there. I really am. And, and, and you know, I'm not sure which way it's going to be, but I'm trying to be good. I'm, I'm really, really, really trying. And I truly believe the, the Bible offers us. Are you ready? The Bible offers us assurance. It's going to come by our choice, but I truly believe the Bible offers us assurance. And here's what I mean by that. John writes in 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you to believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know you have eternal life. Not guess, not hope that maybe you're good enough, so that you might know that you have eternal life. Or as Paul would write in Romans 8, 16, We know that when we choose to follow Jesus and we are a believer and born again, that God gives us his spirit. And it says, and the spirit himself testifies and bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We can have that assurance within our lives. But today I'm going to be kind of looking at just a major, uh, looking at major religions and major themes about the religions, especially dealing with the afterlife or heaven, as some would see it. And really what's held by most religions in the world today, namely that you get what you deserve. And that's just kind of how life is. Most religions see the deity, or some see it as a force and not necessarily a being, but they see the deity as really a good uh, accountant, someone who keeps track of our credits and our debits. And so we think, if I just have 51% credits and 49% debits, I'm going to make it into heaven. And, and I'm just trying to be good. Well, maybe, what if it's like 70-30? 
What if it's 80-20? Uh, I wish the, it was clear so I knew exactly how good I had to be to, make, to be able to make it to heaven. Or maybe it's not even about my credits and what I deserve, but maybe, maybe it's about my effort. If, if I really give that good college effort and say, God, I'm really trying hard, God's going to look down and say, you're great, come on. Or, or maybe it's not about effort so much as it's about my sincerity. If I'm just really sincere with religious beliefs, they could be totally wrong, but I'm sincere. Then God's really going to say, come on up and be, well, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe if it's, I just don't commit that really biggie sins. You know what those biggie sins are. If I don't commit those biggie sins, then God's going to say, come on in. We're going to be in heaven with me. I, I just wish it were so much clearer. In fact, social scientists did a recent study at the University of North Carolina. And it was really on American teenagers, and this was a few years ago. So these are probably people who are in college now or maybe just getting out of college. And, and it gives us a good flavor of the country's belief system. And, and here's the belief system, I think, of, of where we're going, especially with the younger generation. Five things came out of this study. Number one, they believe that a deity exists who created the world and watches over people, although in the last decade, one of the fastest growing things is atheism, people who don't believe there's a God and understand that. Number two, the deity wants us to be nice to each other. Number three, the ultimate purpose in life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. Number four, the deity doesn't have to be involved in our lives except when we need a problem resolved, and then the deity can be there. And number five, good people go to heaven when they die. These are the five things that they came to the conclusion of, which is basically you get what you deserve. If I'm a good person and I meet that criteria somehow, I go to heaven. Now, a lot of times people come up to me and say, well, preacher, aren't all religions basically the same? And in some ways they are. They all address the same hum basic human need. There's a search for God or the transcendent to complete our, our humanness. They, they think we've been born with what they call a God gene within us. That every, every, it seems like almost every group and nation of nation of people has always sought that there's more than just me and us. There's got to be something else out there. Religions are equally sincere most of the time with different things. Um, they, they, and, and I truly believe this. Religions have done a great deal of good for humanity. A great deal of good. Whether it's taking care of the uh, uh, poverty issues, whether it's taking care of the vulnerable, whether it's helping people, whether it's... Uh, education and schools, which were started religiously most of the time, whether it is even medicine and hospitals, which if you notice they're, they're what their names are, you know, like Methodist Hospital and, and Presbyterian Hospital and Lutheran Hospital and St. This or St. That's because they were started by churches and, and those, that's where it came from. They've done so much good, different religions have. And religion basically teaches the same basic moral code. You're supposed to love people, do good, don't harm people, be moral. But religions differ some as well. They differ in their view of the transcendent. Some see it as a, a, a personal being. Some see it as just some kind of force out there. Some people just don't even, they, they think, well, there's, there's polytheism, which means there's gods everywhere. You just find your god that you want. Some people think, believe in a thing called pantheism, which means everything is God. You know, the stand right here is God. Um, it, there's, just, it, there's all these different views that are out there. And they, do, they differ in their solution to human problems also. Some religions say God will help you. Some religions say there's no help. Some religions say it's all about self-help. And they also differ in their view of, of what I would call the, oops, the afterlife or heaven. I love this picture, those two cars parked next to each other. It's perfect of uh, what we're talking about. Um, some say there is no heaven. Atheists, humanism, existentialism, some Eastern religions, uh, heaven's not a place, it's a state of being where you go to. Everyone, some, some say everyone goes to heaven. It's kind of a universalism, and, and heaven is just a part of being human. Some say sincere religious people, no matter what, will go to heaven. And it just makes a part of being a good human makes you be a part of heaven. And some say you have to acknowledge some unique work of God within your religion that's going to get you to that point where you're going to be in heaven. But today we're going to take this comparative look at world religions and their belief system. Now understand, I'm going to hit the tip of the iceberg on religions, okay? Uh, you know, I have a couple minutes. But I want you to see some important things. Because most world religions come to the same conclusion. You get what you deserve. You earn your spot. Good people go to heaven. And it seems fair. It makes good sense. 
And then you look at Christianity comparatively. And then you look at a thing like Easter, and you look at this thing called the cross and the empty tomb, and I think Christianity offers a little different conclusion, and we're going to see that in just a minute. So let's start out with our world religions, and we'll start with Hinduism. 700 plus million followers. The majority are, uh, they believe in a polytheism. There are all kinds of gods out there. You find your god, and you, you, and, and you just stick with your god, and you go with it. Now, the core beliefs are this. There's a thing called Brahman, and Brahman is just this universal, all-encompassing principle of truth. And this is what you want to get to, this, this, um, this amazing place called Brahman, okay? Now, there's a thing called Dharma, and I don't know if you watched Dharma and Greg years ago, or that probably that name came from. Dharma is a principle of law. You get in tune with your Dharma, and you get faithful with it, and that's going to help you get to Brahman, where you are up here. Another thing is called karma. You ever heard of karma before? I hope you have. Karma is the law of right and wrong, of good and bad. You do good, you get a better life or a better rebirth. You do bad, you get a worse life or a worse rebirth because reincarnation is a big part of their system. As I do good, as I earn my place, somehow I keep moving farther and farther towards Brahman until I finally get to this place, and that's what for them is, is like heaven, Brahman, okay? This, this consciousness that's there. Now, the four main goals of Hinduism are material happiness, loving and being loved, doing one's duty, and working to achieve spiritual liberation, the state of consciousness. Heaven's not so much a place, but it's a state of consciousness of Brahman, being one with Brahman. And the conclusion really is, through your works, you earn what you deserve, right? Good people get to their version of what heaven is, the state of consciousness, Buddhism, 300 plus million followers. Buddhism is about the enlightened one, a cosmic consciousness. They believe in polytheism. There's all kinds of gods, but you don't need a god. Their, their core beliefs are their four noble truths. I like this, the first one, okay? The first one is this, suffering. Doesn't that just make you want to be a part of it, right? Suffering, everything about our current existence is suffering. Wow. Wow. And it's caused by our ignorance, but it can be ended with this eightfold path we're going to talk about in a minute that helps you get to where you need to be. Number two, the second noble truth is a cycle of conditioned existence. We are all caught in this endless chain of cause and effect, and we can't seem to get out of it, and it's always about suffering. Number three is called MAGA, which is the eightfold principles of truth. If I just have right speech and conduct and livelihood, if I have right effort and right concentration, right meditation, right thoughts, then I can move to this place called, are you ready, nirvana, which is the final state of enlightenment. And that's where I try to get to. I move into that place of nirvana. Now, the goal is individual realization of the truth through personal seeking and meditative practices. Heaven's not really a, a place, but it's this state of consciousness. But the idea is, through your good works, you earn what you deserve, and good people go to their version of what heaven is. Boom. Islam. One billion followers. It's a monotheism. It's a very strict reliance upon one personal and sovereign God, Allah, their core beliefs are, number one, the Quran, which is a book of teachings given to the prophet Muhammad by Allah. Number two are the prophets. There are 28. Most of them you're going to find in, in the Christian Bible as well. And, and, and Muhammad is the final and most important prophet. Number three is judgment is important. All humanity will be judged by Allah based on whether they submitted to Allah and Allah's teachings. The goal are the five pillars of Islam. Shahada, which is your faith. There's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet, number one. Number two <clears throat> is the Salah, which is the prayer observed five times a day. You face Mecca and you pray five times. Number three is a fasting time. You fast from dawn to dusk during the month of Ramadan. Number four is charity. Charity is important to give to the poor, the widow, the orphan, and to take care of others. And number five is a pilgrimage to Mecca at least one time in your life. But the conclusion is simple. You follow the rules. 
through your works and your obedience, you earn what you deserve and good people go to heaven. Makes sense. Judaism. There it is, Judaism. 15 plus million followers in the world. It's called an ethical monotheism. There's a single personal righteous God interested in humanity. His name's Yahweh. The core beliefs are Torah and law, rules to live by. They've been given to us by God. Another key core belief is covenant. God enters into covenant with humanity, and he acts in history as he does so. And number three, an important part is land. God has given them a land as a promise. They believe in this is where they're going with it. Now, the goal is responsible observance of the law, and justice comes from that. Judgment. You will be judged by the law or by your observance to its rules and your good works or your disobedience. The conclusion is you follow the rules, and through your works, you get what you deserve. You earn what you deserve. Good people go to heaven to be with God. See, most religions kind of have the same idea. I earn it, I work at it, I be a good person, and I get to this place where, boom, I get to be there. See, mostly, they all hold that same basic tenet. There's the moral code, there's an address to human needs. You work for your salvation. It's self-effort. You earn your place. Good people move up, bad people move down, whether you consider it heaven or hell or a state of consciousness. It's always about what I've done. It's, it's based on my works and what I've earned and what I deserve. Comparatively, Christianity. Christianity holds many of the same tenets with one small difference. Christianity says this, in Jesus, you don't get what you deserve. Anybody like that idea? You will. See, karma, we see karma out there. Karma says what you put there comes back to you. Even in the scripture that we have, it says you reap what you sow. You look at just the physics and, and nature itself and the laws of physics. Every action has what? An equal and opposite reaction. You see, we see that idea in, in nature and in our world. But this whole idea of grace and mercy and love, that's godly stuff. And it says a whole lot more about who God is. See, the idea of grace and love, it defies logic and reason in our world. And this is the power of Easter for us. Are you ready? Romans 3.23 says this, All have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've all sinned. Isaiah 64.6, Even our righteous acts are like filthy rags in God's sight. We talked about this, John 3, not too long ago. The fact that Jesus said we are all under condemnation. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. So we are under judgment and condemnation. Every single person who's ever been on the face of the earth is under condemnation because we've sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Physical death, mental, emotional, spiritual death. Every aspect in our lives. But something amazing happened through the cross and the empty tomb. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. You see, a great exchange took place. For anyone willing to acknowledge God's unique work in Jesus and, and, and the incarnation, Jesus being born, his life that he lived, the cross, the resurrection, a great exchange takes place. I want you to see this. Jesus takes our sin, its brokenness, its punishment, its wages into his body, and he suffers death. In exchange, he gives us his righteousness, his life, his clean record in its place. The great exchange. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. That great exchange so that he could bring us to God. Because of our faith and belief in Jesus, we can celebrate the fact that we don't get what we deserve. Jesus got what we deserved. Isn't that amazing? And gave us what we don't deserve. His righteousness, 
in the midst of it. So our scripture, for our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Timothy puts it this way, or Paul as he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy. There's one God and one mediator between God and all of humanity, the person, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as a ransom for all. As a follower of Jesus, we recognize good people don't earn their way to heaven. Forgiven people find heaven through God's grace and mercy and love. We don't earn our way through our efforts and our work. We put our trust and our faith in Jesus. And I truly believe God's message today is this. And are everybody listening? Right here. The message today is this. If you're trying to earn your way to God, stop it because you're never going to get there. All right? Everybody hear that? Stop it. You will never get there. That's not what it's about. If you're going to trust in your own works and your own efforts and what you've earned yourself, then you will get what you deserve and you're not going to like what that is. But you see, heaven, it's about grace and mercy. It's not about works. Now, the scripture makes it clear there are plenty of good works and mission and ministry we do. But all of that literally flows out of now this relationship that we have through God, with God, through Jesus Christ. And now the good works begin to flow. We don't earn a relationship with God because of our good works, but because we have a relationship now with God, we've given up the unrighteousness and got Jesus' righteousness. Now we begin to walk, and we walk in love and mercy, and we begin to walk in good works in everything that we're doing. It flows out of that new life and new birth. See, grace is not opposed to works or hard work or effort or hard work or, or, or love or service. It's opposed to earning something through them. So I truly believe God's telling us today as we step into this time of post-Easter and where we're going to go this spring and this year I believe God is saying this. Stop trying to earn it. Rest in my love and my grace. And then live the life you've been called to live. See, Christianity is different. It says we don't get what we deserve. We get better than what we deserve. We get Jesus, his righteousness, his life, his power, his love, and his goodness. Will you join me in this post-Easter to trust in Jesus and start walking in the good works that you've been called to do? Can we do that? Yeah? That's what God wants for us. And stop trying to earn it because you'll never get there. Amen?